Hi, I'm uh, Nico Savage. Um, this is uh, one of my first uh, video presentations, so I'm a little nervous, and um, I'm sorry about that. Uh, um, I also live with five other people, so sorry if you hear any noises or weird sounds. So um, I'm going to do my presentation on Father Marquette. Um, and before I start, I just want to say that I was really interested in reading about him and how he took his religion and applied it to much more than just that of spreading it around and Honestly, it's quite, quite courageous what he did, and, and back then, just moving and exploring. And he, he was a great, great figure for our state of Michigan. That's where he is. But uh just want to say that he's yeah, just a great person, and I really admired some of the stuff he did. So I'll start off by reading a couple journals about him, a, a personal journals he had about his interactions with the natives. And then I'm going to give you a synopsis of his life and how he went about it. So. He was uh, born in June 1st, uh, 1637, and joined the Society of Jesus and became a Jesuit missionary at 17 years old. So he studied and taught He studied and taught at the Jesuit colleges in France for about 12 years before his superiors assigned him in 1666 to uh, be a missionary to the indigenous people of Americas, and he traveled to Quebec, so, and he was, so he had a great great ability of understanding and learning languages at honestly a fast rate so he learned six different native american dialects and became an expert in the huron language which is what our professor said that the french had such a great relationship with the hurons obviously the war they had with the iroquois and englishmen and it just goes to show that like he was all bought bought into the culture of the native americans too but he also wanted to express his religious views to them too so in 1668, he, they want since he did such a great job in the um, colony, and he they wanted him to go up towards the St. Lawrence River and the Western Great Lakes regions. So he helped establish the first missions at Sault Ste. Marie in Michigan, and it was the first European settlement actually in Michigan in 1668. And then also he helped establish or establish St. Ignatius, also in Michigan in 1671. So. He's doing all this stuff, interacting with natives, and I think it's just great what he's doing. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at this stuff. And so he doesn't stop there. Um, he actually gets in contact with a guy named Louis Joliet, who's a French-Canadian fur trader and explorer. And they were chosen to lead a missionary, or lead a mission or an expedition that included five men in two canoes to find a direction in the mouth of the Mississippi River, which the natives called Mississippi or and the Great Water is what they called it. Um, so, despite what Joliet wanted, the other travelers wanted, where they just wanted to map and like be geographers and map the land, he wanted to spread the word of God among the people he encountered on the way. And I and I and that's very challenging to do with natives who have their very strong customs and stuff. But he wanted to do that, so they traveled westward to Green Bay, which is or which is present day Green Bay in Wisconsin, and ascended to the Fox River to a portage that crossed the Wisconsin River and entered the Mississippi um, near. Excuse, I'm not very good at reading French. Prior to Duchene on June 17, 1673, following the river to the mouth of the Arkansas River, which is which is within 435 miles of the Gulf of Mexico. Marquette and Juliet learned that it flowed through hostile Spanish domains, and fearing an encounter with the Spanish colonists and explorers, decided to return homeward by the way of the Illinois River in mid-July. So you can tell that they want to, the Spanish, they want to encounter them, or anything like that they want to do. Um, so... Um, so... He encountered, so on this expedition, he encountered a lot of Indian trinkets and stuff and new, and new Native Americans that, tribes that he's never seen before. Um, so, I'm going to read a couple journals from you when he encountered these natives from Mississippi. So, this is a uh, part six, I think, and... They're going through unknown territory, and he's describing it, and they arrive at Mississippi. So, again, excuse me for my pronunciation of some of these words. So, here we go. Here we are at Muscountis. The word may in Algonquin mean the Fire Nation, which indeed is the name given to this tribe. Here is the limit of the discoveries which the French have made, for they have not gone any further. 
farther. This village consists of three nations who have gathered there, the Miamis, the Muscatans, and the Kikabaos. The former are the most civil and the most liberal, and they are the most shapely. They wear, they wear two long locks over their ears, which give them a pleasing appearance. They are regarded as warriors and rarely undertake expeditions without being successful. They are very docile and listen quietly to what is said to them, and they are Peter appeared so eager to hear Father Alawas, which when he instructs them when they gave him but little rest, even during the night. The Skeletons and Kabaudans Kipawas are ruder and seem peasants in comparison with the others. As bark for making cabins is scarce in the country, they use rushes. They, they serve them for making the walls and roofs, but do not afford them much production against the winds, and still less against the range. When they fall, when they when they fall abundantly, the advantage of cabins of this kind is that they make packages of them and easily transport them where they wish while they are hunting. So obviously, the terrain he's kind of describing of how they live in different houses and cabins is not very common in the South, obviously, and he's also describing the appearance of the Native Americans and what they're doing. So I'm going to go to keep, continue reading the journal. Um, when I visited them, I was greatly consoled at seeing a handsome cross erected in the middle of the village and adorned with many white skins, red pelts, bows and arrows, which these good people have offered to great Manitou. This is the name which they gave God. It is to thank them for having had pity on them during the winter by giving them an abundance of game when they most dreaded famine. I took pleasure in ob observing the situation of this village. It is beautiful and very pleasing for our from an immense upon which is placed, one beholds on every side prairies extending farther than the eye can see, interspread with groves or with lofty trees. The soil is very fertile, yields much Indian corn. The savages gather quantities of plums and grapes wherever with much wine could be made if desired. So all again, he's describing some of the resources they have compared that they don't have compared to the north a little bit, and the soil is very fertile. He's describing which back then was. A very big deal. So I'm going to continue reading. No sooner than we have arrived, Monsieur Joliet and one assembled the elders together, and he told them that he was sent by Monsieur, our governor, to discover new countries, while I was sent by God to illumine them with the light of holy gospel. I told them that, moreover, than the sovereign master of our lives wished to be known all the, by all the nations, that in obeying this, his will, I feared not the death to which I exposed myself in the voyages so perilously. He informed them that we needed two guides to show us the way, and we gave them a present, and by asking them to grant us the guides. To this, they very civilly consented and also spoke to us by means of present consisting of not to serve us a bed during the whole of our voyage. So I think right now what the, what he's saying through this journal is that he's asking, the, the Joliet and Father Marquette are asking these leaders of this village to grant them a guide basically throughout this voyage, like their expedition of the area. And they consent because of the way they're able to talk to the natives and having a nice relationship and not demanding like other um, colonies have been, like the Dutch or the English of the Indians. So they really, really respected the natives. And then I'm going to continue reading. On the following day, the 10th of June, two Miamians who were giving us guides embarked with us in the sight of a great crowd who could not sufficiently express their astonishment with the sight of seven freshmen alone in two canoes daring to undertake so extraordinary and so hazardous an expedition. We knew that a three leagues from McCowan's was a river which discharged into the Mississippi. We knew also the direction we were to follow in order to reach it was southwesterly, but the road is broken, so many swamps and small lakes that it is, it is easy to lose one's way, especially the river leading thither so full of wild oats that it is difficult to find in the channel. For this reason, we greatly needed our two guides who safely conducted us to a portage of 2,700 paces and helped us transport our canoes to enter that river after which they returned home leaving us alone in the unknown country in the hands of the province. So again they were just very thankful for uh, the guides that they were given and they're doing and now they're on their own basically. So I'm going to continue reading. Thus we left the waters following the Quebec four or five hundred leagues from here so to float to float on those that would be thenceforth take us through strange lands before Embarking thereon, we began altogether a new devotion to the blessed Virgin Immaculate, which we practiced daily, addressing 
to her special prayers to place under protection both of our persons and the success of our voyage. After mutually enc encouraging one another, we entered our canoes. The river in which we embarked is called Muskui. It is very wide. It is a sandy bottom which forms various shoals that render its navigation very difficult. It is full of islands covered with vines on the banks. Once he's fertile land, diverse with woods, prairies, hills. There are oak, walnut, and basswood trees, another kind whose branches are armed with long thorns. We saw there neither game, there's ne there ne neither feathered game nor fish, but many deer and a large number of cattle. Our route, route J to the southwest, after navigating about 30 leagues, we saw a spot presenting all the appearance of the iron mine. And in fact, one of our party who had formerly seen such mines assures us that the one which we found is very good and very rich. It is covered with three feet of good soil and is quite near a chain of rocks, which is base covered by vine trees. After proceeding four leagues, 40 leagues to the same route, we arrived a month of our river in 42 and a half degrees of latitude. We safely entered Mississippi on the 17th of June. A joy I cannot express. So that's the end of that journal. There's 10 journals here. I'm not going to read all of them, but so right there to describing the land and obviously and he was describing what animals were in the area and and he said that there weren't enough there weren't a lot of birds or anything like that and I and which I found interesting there wasn't that much fish but there was plenty of deer and plenty of cattle which is pretty good um, I'm gonna read another journal just one second. So in this journal, they're talking about Illinois and the customs of it. And he's describing Illinois right now, and I'm going to talk about it right now. So when one speaks the word Illinois, it is as if one said in their language the men, as if other savages were looked upon them by merely as animals. It must also be admitted that they do have an air of humanity, which we have not observed in other nations we have seen upon our route. The shortness of my stay among them did not allow them, me to secure all the information I would have desired among their customs following that I've observed. So he's just talking a little bit about Illinois and he wished he was a little there a little bit longer to understand the customs and what he wanted to do. I'm there, so I'm going to start describing the, or I'm going to read his description of the languages. They're divided into many villages, some of which are quite distant from which we speak, which is called Piora. This causes some differences in their language, which on the whole resembles Algonquin. So they are, we easily understood each other. There are gentle, intractable dis disposition. We experienced this in the reception which they gave us. They have several wives of whom are they are extremely jealous. They watch them very closely and cut off their noses or ears when they misbehave. Uh, I saw several women who bore the marks of their misconduct. Their bodies are shapely. They are active and very skillful with bows and arrows. They also use guns which they buy from our savage allies who trade with our French. They are used to especially inspire them, inspire through their noise and smoke and terror and the enemies. The latter do not use guns and never have seen any since they live too far toward the west. They are they are warlike and make themselves dreaded by the distant tribes to the south and west and whether they go to procure slaves these these they barter selling them at a high price with other nations in exchange for other wares. So I'm gonna stop in the middle of that it's a little bit much. But so he was just describing how Knowing the Algonquin language, and this is so why why he was so loved, is because he was able to talk to uh, new tribes and not even understand their full language, but have the good core base of the Algonquin. And obviously, he's just describing the women um, who the men have several wives, which is crazy. And then for they get jealous of each other, and then obviously punishing the women if they misbehave in their very warlike these Indians in Illinois. Um, it, so he's describing that and he's describing the culture and how good they are with guns and they're actually very business heavy it seems like with the trade they're willing to make on other people and stuff. So that was just a little passage about his experience in Illinois. Um, so I'm going to go back to... Uh, his journey to Mississippi and him turning around, he did end up contracting a, um, a bad uh, 
they call it a bout of dysentery, dysentery, which he contracted during the Mississippi expedition and snapped his, his sapped his health. So he does return. He does return to Saint Ignatius, and he dies around age thirty-seven in Ludington, Michigan. So, um, that's it. You know, that's I read his journals, and I I hope that gave you a clear description of what he was an uh, explorer, a missionary, loved spreading his religion to other people and talking to the natives and had such a unique relationship with him. And that's why he's such a memorable figure, not only in Michigan, but there's also a university in Wisconsin named Marquette after him. So, all right. Thank you. I'm sorry if I, my reading was bad and yeah. So have a good day.